So today we look at the connections of climate change, pandemics, and urban transformations. Okay, this is a, a lecture which I had actually put together because you know while researching on the different uh, you know pandemics that we've had in the past, I was amazed to note that you know there are so many things which we take for granted in our day to day lives, which are basically um, an outcome of our reaction to a pandemic or an epidemic. And while we go through the slides, you'll understand, you know, what I mean and why do I say that. And it's important for us to kind of know and understand these because that will help us not only in landscape, but also in understanding urban design and understanding architecture in many ways and what. So to begin with, we have to understand what exactly is a pandemic. So um, can anybody help me out with this? You know, what is the difference between an epidemic and a pandemic? Anyone? Yeah, epidemic so is a specific, specific area. Probably, yeah. Okay, uh, Parthia, go ahead. Because I, I couldn't make out who was the other person. Yeah. yeah, so epidemic is mostly uh, limited to a region or a city. And hmm. a pandemic is uh, probably spread across more countries. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it, so essentially, a pandemic is an epidemic which has a much larger geographic reach. You know, sometimes it could span continents, sometimes it would span the entire uh, world, like what we are facing right now. So that is the difference. And an epidemic, per se, is a contagious disease which is, you know, which is difficult to control and, you know, it, it's kind of spreading, but probably region specific. So a pandemic is an epidemic, but with a much larger magnitude. So um, if you think that, you know, uh, Corona was one of the first pandemics that have affected in the recent past, then it's, it's partly wrong because we've had epidemics breaking out every now and then. Okay, the image that I'm uh, showing you on the screen is essentially um, an epidemic graph of the last um, 60 um, 70 years till 2012. Huh? So this is an old uh, image, but then just look at it, you know, like if you look at it, you'd find there are lots of epidemics which have happened in a one year event up to six year events. So now you may ask me, Sandeep, if you look at this graph, it seems as if there have been more epidemics in the US and the Europe than the rest of the world. I mean, that's how it, it seems, right? But the truth is many of the epidemics that may have happened in let's say, uh, the southern, the, the, the global south countries, you know, like in Africa, in South America, in parts of Asia, many of these epidemics may not even have been recorded. That's the truth. You know? So this graph only depicts the information which they had at that point of time. But the truth is, I mean, the reason I'm showing this to you is because just to tell you that epidemics are common. It's not a, it's not a rare occurrence. Now, if we talk of pandemics, okay, the image on the left, you know, kind of tells you the 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 the, the large global pandemics which have you know kind of affected the world, you know, beginning from the the recordical evidence of time. You know? So, so we've had plague which has you know kind of killed a lot of people in the past. Then we've had cholera, you know, in in the last and the century before, you know, which have been great problems we've had smallpox you know which was a which was a major pandemic around the world starting from the 16th century onwards you know or even before but then uh, you know majorly from the 16th century onwards and then recently you know we've had like 100 years back we've had the spanish flu which was also a novel corona uh, uh, sorry a corona virus um an h1n1 spread uh, flu then we've had many such pandemics in between. We've had the Asian flu, the Hong Kong flu, the SARS, you know, the swine flu, MERS, all of these are actually H1N1 virus spread diseases. Okay, and the, the other large, uh, you know, global pandemic which has always been bothering people in, in our lifetimes is HIV AIDS, you know, which probably started in the 70s, documented in the 80s, and ever since it's been, you know, um, affecting a lot of people and killing them. 
so in comparison to all of that covid is a much um, recent uh, you know scenario but then the problem with covid is that unlike the earlier pandemics uh, the spread of covid is tremendous you know it can it, it's highly contagious that is the problem so a uh, disease outbreaks if you look at the graph you know you would find that they are becoming more and more um, common in the recent past now the reason for that is because of population growth and demographic changes in the past even if you would have had a pandemic it would have affected a certain part of the society and or a certain part of the world and then it would have you know kind of um ended right there but now the problem is you know we have too many people living too close to each other you know and our lifestyles are so interconnected that it's difficult for us to contain contagious diseases also to add to it we have increased mobility you know people traveling from one part of the world to all the other parts um like wuhan you know if it does but there was a very interesting graph you know like wuhan has an international airport and it has direct connections to the middle east to um you know europe to america to australia to singapore you know so you know it was easy for the uh, for the uh, pandemic to kind of travel you know for people to host the disease and take it to different places then also our um, we've been encroaching majorly into biodiversity you know we've been encroaching majorly into um, you know biodiverse um hotspots so what have been happening is that we've we've started increasingly interacting with animals and you know vector hosts which probably have not been happening for the last many years of course when we were cave dwellers and when we were living in the forest these interactions would have been common place but now things have kind of changed and you know we've been living a immune life for a long time and but then of late you know with our interactions with uh, animals have been increasing throughout history if you look at it you know diseases in urban life have had a very very innate you uh, know relationship and diseases have always had a profound impact on the design of cities you know so and that's important for us to understand because you know for us to understand landscape or architecture you know a, a certain understanding of urbanism is also required now how have diseases shaped urban life you know so even from the from the very olden times when we did not have a scientific acumen you know humans have always known that you know climatic conditions affect epidemic diseases and so that particular point of time you know we did not know the germ theory you know germ theory means the 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 the, the understanding the scientific understanding that most diseases are caused by microbes so we had other reasons to say oh you know it's you know diseases are spreading but it's probably because of miasma now what is miasma miasma is the rotting smell that comes out of organic matter which rots you know like for example ek kachde ke peti ke paas se jab aap guzarte ho to uske andar se ek ajeeb sa you know badbu aati hai so that was what was referred to as a miasma of course wo badbu kyu aati hai it's because of microbes which are uh, decomposing the organic waste which is there you know but then we did not know because microscopes were in discovered we did not know about microbes but we definitely knew that it's that smell that's causing the disease so um you know and and we also knew that different climatic conditions aggravated the spread of diseases and some climatic conditions reduced the spread of diseases you know so in in the past if you look at it you know from the lessons that we have to learn from the past you know, we know that people have this redesigned cities they have laid out infrastructure they have reimagined architecture you know they have even kind of completely redone interiors you know and then when i say people i don't mean like individuals but i mean humanity as a whole all in the name of minimizing risk of infectious diseases how is it i'll tell you in the next few slides so in history we know that roman aristocrats used to you know move to the hill resorts every summer just to avoid malaria because uh, spread of malaria in rome during the summers was a common occurrence they didn't know the reason but they knew that okay that you know at least you know this is the time when the disease spreads more uh the people who live in the in south asia knew very early on that 
you know that eating spicy curried food with a lot of spices you know kind of reduces the chances of getting diarrhea and it's it's probably because of the antimicrobial properties of many of the spices that we've had you know and also curried food basically means that you have to cook the food you know otherwise the, the curry spices would remain kacha so when you cook the food you know the microbes die rather than having a a, a bland you know raw meal which is there and then the theory that i spoke to you about you know the miasma theory versus the germ theory so miasma theory was the accepted theory in the medieval ages and up until the beginning of um 19th century sorry 8, 20th century you know up until the, the late 19th century you know like 1880s 1890s that you know it was believed that it was miasma theory was the accepted fact we spoke about uh, central park new york last time if you guys remember so there is one aspect of central park which i didn't mention last time but then i thought it was imperative that we speak about it today so uh, it was essentially the belief that malaria and cholera were caused by lack of fresh air you know and the obnoxious you know the gases of uh, you know decomposition you know miasma which inspired uh, frederick law olmsted to actually propose and design the central park the way it is you know almost like a countryside or a forest within the city the image that you see on the right is another ambitious project which was also done in the 19th century by frederick law olmsted uh, it's called the emerald necklace okay now why is it called the emerald necklace you know it's called the emerald necklace because uh it was one of the world's first greenways you know urban greenways now what are greenways greenways are essentially these corridors within the city wherein you could cycle through you could walk through you know you could even drive across you know if a greenway is designed with a vehicular movement but everywhere from beginning till the end you'd feel like you are moving within a forest or within a you don't see the city per se you know so it's like a, a it's like a linear park i mean if i could tell you in simple words it's like a linear park which essentially behaves like a connector through the city so imagine if mumbai had a greenway you know let's say uh, the mithi river was reimagined as a greenway then one could actually cycle down all the way from uh, you know jogeshwari vikroli link road jvlr through that greenway along mithi you know which would possibly be clean there are trees all around there are parks there are you know places for you to pause and you know do some exercise you know there are um, you know areas where you know school children are playing you know in playgrounds which are there you could actually literally cycle it down all the way to bkc you know without even having to cross any roads without even having to you know kind of um, you know of the fear that you know you would get run over by a truck or something like that so uh the water body that you see on the top left hand corner of that image is the charles river and this green patch this sinuous green patch that kind of moves across the urban fabric to the uh, the front of the photograph at the bottom of the photograph you know that is another river which is a tributary to the charles river it's called the muddy river m u d d y muddy river okay and the muddy river was basically developed as a greenway and imagine this is 170 years back you know and and we are still struggling you know with you know proposing you know meaningful changes to our rivers our our urban rivers you know so there is so much of wealth around in the world that we really do not have to reinvent the wheel you know we just have to know you know the the rights and the wrongs which the other cities have done in the past and also when we adapt ensure that we adapt it to our geoclimatic conditions you know our political conditions our social conditions our economic conditions so maybe for us it's it may not be a great idea to actually spend you know crores and crores of rupees just to you know beautify a street that may not have that may not make sense but for us it definitely does make sense to you know actually create an urban move which may not be as expensive but may maybe much much more effective for you know all social classes all socio economic classes that's important for us this map that you see on the screen right now is actually a a, a very very important uh, piece of graphic because this was for the first time so till then cholera was believed to be caused by bad air you know miasma but there was a visionary physician who lived in london uh, whose whose name was john snow he started documenting 
uh, you know, the disease. So, and, uh, but this was not the first time in epidemics were documented, okay? So, what we do right now, our ROK Setu app and, you know, all the other apps which other governments have made, they are all basically, in a way, we are documenting the epidemic. You know? and, um, there are um, ministries of health which actually document uh, disease spreads through, you know, other softwares like, you know, geographic information systems, GIS softwares, etc. You know, to know where have, you know, the diseases been spreading, which all neighborhoods and that's how we've been able to control, right? So there is a geographic aspect to the uh, epidemic. But this was not the first time the epidemic was, uh, you know, documented. So in, even in the 16th century, we've had uh, plague maps which were being made manually. But this map was essential because, you know, the, the black uh, blocks that you see on the sides of the streets, like let's say, for example, if you look at Broad Street, you know, if you can see this Broad Street, which is there on the screen, uh, these black extensions that you see there, uh, they are basically not building blocks, but they are basically, the, it's like a bar chart, you know, the number of people who have been infected by cholera. So, you know, what, what this person did, did is, and, and naturally, when you look at it, you know that most of the diseases which are there in this locality are concentrated towards this patch and there is an increased incidence of people in this particular street. Now what he did was he did a correlation. He said, well, the air is the same that people would, you know, uh, you know, kind of inhale in the Marlboro street or in the Great Palshad Street, you know, as is the same with Broad Street. But then why is it that, you know, people in this particular locality get infected while the ones who are living in these areas are not getting infected at all? He traced the water connections. He looked at water, what is common between these, uh, these streets. And he realized that all these streets are basically fed in from the same watering hole. There was a well which was, you know, kind of supplying water to these streets. And he realized that when he tested the water of that well, they realized that that water was getting contaminated because of uh, sewage, you know, ingress. And that was for the first time that it was, you know, kind of uh, established that it's water contamination that creates cholera. And also the fact that, you know, this was also very important for us as architects and landscape architects because this was for the first time, you know, that spatial thinking was, spatial thinking was, you know, kind of brought into an epidemic. Now, with that, how did things change? So, with that, you know, infrastructural development came into being. And it was understood that, you know, you need to have a sewage system within the city. You cannot just let the sewage flow through the same drains and, you know, go and infect the, drain, uh, the, the rivers. Along the same time, around in 1858, you know, there was an incident that happened in London, which was called the Great Stink. Okay. So, why is it called the Great Stink? So, uh, in the... The UK British of, uh, sorry, in the UK um, British Parliament in the House of Commons, you know, you had, uh, they had a huge gathering, but they couldn't sit inside and even have a meaningful conversation because of the stink that was, you know, because of the, the stinking air that was there, you know, which was coming from the, um, from the River Thames, uh, you know, on the sides of which is the British Parliament. And that, 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 that smell was so obnoxious that it said that, you know, they literally had to dip bed sheets in um, phenyl or in disinfectant solution. And then they had to hang it around the corridors, multiple layers of them, just so that people inside could, you know, breathe or, you know, could feel that, okay, you know, at least there is some sort of disinfectant that is, you know, kind of, uh, or some sort of a different smell that's coming in. So, um, the reason why this was is because, you know, it, it didn't rain that particular year. And usually what happens is during the summer when the decomposition levels actually kind of go up, it would rain and, you know, the water would get pushed into the sea. But it was that incident that kind of pushed these, um, you know, the, the, the British to kind of, you know, start a major urban design project, which we still love in India. And we still look around for, you know, op opportunities to beautify our rivers. So what you see on the left is basically the great uh, Victorian embankment project, wherein what they did is they created, you know, bund walls on the sides of River Thames and they extended the public plaza there and they created a effective sewage system. So there was a sewage system and, you know, the sewage system basically, so all the waste which would basically get dumped into the river were then intercepted and that waste was basically, uh, you know, uh, collected 
and they would pump it into the river but after the city you know downstream the city which later on again created a lot of trouble so then they realized oh that is not the best way so now you have proper sewage treatment facilities which take care of it but what that did was that you know it created a riverfront promenade you know it created a very very vibrant public space now what are we doing with our rivers you know we are beautifying rivers like let's say sabarmati for example you know we are beautifying the rivers we are creating exactly this you know we are channelizing the river we are putting in um an edge we are you know kind of um, creating this public space on the top but we forget the real logic why these things were done in the past you know and um, so straight jacketing a river or channelizing a river is always a problem in india because uh, one could do that in uk because you know the, the if you look at the flooding patterns of river thames it's highly regulated naturally you know because we have a phenomenon called the monsoons which they do not have you know for us you know intermittent rains and you know a uh, a whole cycle over a year where it rains and then it goes dry then it rains and it goes dry is not a norm for us for us we have a dry period we have a uh, a winter post which we have the summers and then we have the torrential monsoons which hit india you know and then so it's it's imperative for the rivers to flood and then go down you know which is why for us to maintain the flood plains like if you look at all traditional cities even though all our civilizations were close to river fronts they were never within the river flood plains they were always away from the river flood plain you no know, because the logic was understood you know we would live with nature you know not live against it so this is a very important aspect you know which many urban design studios or many urban design uh, you know practices don't understand you know the the river front and the and the beautification and the promenade did not just come up because it was a successful public place that they had to create or because it was beautiful but it had a much more scientific reason and then comes this, the story of paris so this is a very you know complicated intricate story as well so uh, paris in the uh, early 1800 and uh, you know 1820s and 30s and you know uh, all of those were literally a, a squalor you know it's like there were winding lanes all around you know there were houses in which people were living in really bad conditions plague was a big problem out there it would break out in places cholera was a much more feared killer because you know people could die so badly tuberculosis disease which you know which was a big city and that was when uh, you know napoleon came into power and he decided that okay now he had lost a war somewhere and he had to kind of change the whole um, you know the political story out there you know so what did he do he did the obvious you know which many rulers have been doing uh, you know even now you know he said let's reinvent the city you know let's relook at paris you know and he called in baron hosman you know who and um, you know alafa who is a landscape architect and baron hosman who is a designer or an architect you know and both of them got together and he said let's just change the face of paris you know we have to help the city because you know the city is undergoing tremendous cholera outbreaks we have to you know kind of upgrade the city and we also have to make paris one of the most beautiful cities in the world the people in paris have to be proud of their city what they did was like this the small engraving that you see on the top right is exactly what they did you know they just cut across they didn't actually make a plan or a map or anything okay they just cut across these boulevards in the city fabric you know chak 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 you know like a slice like you like you cut a cake you know like the same manner you kind of cut a slice through the city and they just you know cleared up people many people were basically moved out of the city and they built beautiful five story buildings on the edges of all these avenues you know so they essentially gave like you remember we spoke about kevin lynch in the last lecture you know where you have how, how do you how do you image image a city you know how do you think of a city you know you have nodes you know so this one the 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 tar of the star you know uh arc de la arc de la toile you know the 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 arc of the sorry was it the it's arc called the arc de triomphe not triumph yeah, uh, yeah, 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 absolutely right it's called the arc de triomphe you know the arc of the triumph you know where uh you know which basically you know is the center of one of the nodes in paris 
and then you have these large avenues which are there you know the bulwarks as they call it you know so this is like if you look at it that is like a node and then you have you know the paths and then you have the edges you know where you have these beautiful buildings that kind of you know uh uh be an edge on the sides but within these different districts you would still have the squalor still going on you know that's how it was but later on over the years you know uh, things changed they put a, a very strong infrastructure line now everyone talks of paris you know like if you haven't come across um th- these discourses ever you will soon you know in in different webinars and in different uh, you know books and all of that but hardly anyone actually talks about you know the construction of the sewage system and the fresh water system and you know the upgradation of the infrastructure and this was basically in a way um you know a representation of you know of us responding towards diseases in urban life but it was also a political statement why because during those days you know um revolutions were very common in france you know so protesting mob fury was a very common thing in the city and it was very difficult for the authorities to quell these mobs because the authority men would be um, on horses how were the streets of paris they were all winding you know very narrow they would get wider then go narrow then there would be turns so somebody the mob would be hiding behind a turn and while these people were on the horses they could just you know jump out and you know scare the horses and you know just rush in you know so and and you know controlling a mob by horses was getting ineffective for them and what do these amazingly wide grand avenues do of course they are beautiful of course they are for the people and of course it's creating a public space but in reality this was a, a very very sure shot way of ensuring that the equestrian forces could basically control or quell a mob or even if people were moving let's say if there was a mob that was assembling and moving across somebody standing here could see it from a distance and it's amazing because these principles of you know the streets being at a certain angle is actually developed out of the french gardens that they have had you know in their chateaux and in their you know um in in their you know um large parks that they uh, they have been making for hunting the hunting grounds which again has a scientific backing you know because these angles are not just angles for the sake of it but essentially if a person is standing there and if you're looking out this basically leads to their cone of vision you know we have a cone of vision right you know there is a 60 degree a 35 degree a 45 degree you know there is a certain cone of vision that our eyes can see if i'm standing somewhere and looking at the horizon without i having to dart my eyes left to right so if there is a movement within that you know within that vision uh, you know a uh, frame i can easily spot it you know so essentially there were scientific reasons behind you know doing all this but they were all you know kind of uh, sugar coated and straight jacketed and you know kind of presented as you know creating a public space so if you're interested in reading more about it i would urge you to read about it i'll share uh, some readings from the central park um, you know last time as well which i'm i'm sorry i could i i i didn't get the time to do it i'll do that okay then comes the 20th century you know so you know of tuberculosis right i mean it's a real problem even for us in mumbai you know it's a real problem you know? so um during the 19th century one out of seven people in the world were dying because of tuberculosis and the numbers were one in three in paris you know like one out of three people were dying because of tuberculosis so you can imagine you know what an epidemic you know it would have been but obviously you know the way we design cities the way we design architects you know kind of respond to uh, you know entities you know we were all working ahead to kind of quell this problem of tuberculosis so in many ways and one you know tuberculosis was also responsible for the modernist architecture movement you know so for us to eschew you know ornamentation and then start looking at um, you know features like flat roofs balconies terrace gardens you know the fact that you know one could gain enough exposure to sunlight and ventilation you know large windows simple details you know so even though all of this was also a stylish uh, you know way of kind of a stylistic and ever but at the same time it also had a functional disease control and you know the idea that you know modern architecture had to do everything with sun light and air like if you uh, listen to um, corbusier ever you know in his design uh, discourses on the design of uh, of chandigarh you know as a city 
you would often come across this term that he did mention that the city was all about the sun uh the air and verdure you know and greenery you know verdure you know so he basically you know kind of speaks about sun and greenery as being an integral part of the city and naturally so this building that just appeared on the screen which one is it can anyone tell me which which building is this villa savoy villa savoy exactly naturally so and who designed it who designed it corbusier corbusier the corbusier yeah exactly so when corbusier designed villa savoy you know his personal beliefs and his you know his motto of his uh, you know the the way in which they worked it was pretty clear because you enter villa savoy perched behind a a column actually not hidden but almost visible was a wash basin so the idea was that you know you kind of come from outside you actually wash your hands and you sanitize yourself and then you walk in you know i mean that was the 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 you know the the whole understanding of you know the spread of germs and you know and how do you kind of prevent diseases from kind of um, you know coming in so and and zoom into 2020 what are we doing right now when we go out by, to the market you know or to buy some medicines and we come back the first thing we do is you know somebody in the house opens the door for us we rush to the the toilet we wash our hands right so you know i mean some things don't change you know some sometimes the simplest the simplest responses that we humans have had to disease control and and i have i've attended a lot of webinars in this you know this um uh, lockdown and many of the architects have been speaking of you know relooking at the design of buildings you know and you know so they've been saying that okay maybe in the foyer one needs to have a facility to you know kind of hold uh sanitizers or to have a wash basin you know so that's going to be the new normal this what they are uh, talking about and then it and it's not surprising that they speak about these things because um as surprising as it may sound to us because a lot of our things a lot of the ways that we live in today are basically shaped by diseases why do we have toilets stacked on toilets in apartments you know the reason being we need to have a stack system in which the water supply and the sewage can be handled and how did the stack system of sewage and water supply come into being it was essentially these cholera outbreaks which you know did it for us how did our toilet start having wash basins and ceramic tiles it's ubiquitous right everywhere you go you find ceramic tiles on the toilets it was not the case in you know 100 years back you know toilets in the uh, in the west actually had carpeted floors you know they had wooden paneling you know and and of course water would fall on it you know there would be mold growing in it but they would keep cleaning it they would keep polishing it you know they would keep maintaining it but then they realized that most of the diseases that people had was also because of the fact that there were microbes growing within their houses which they couldn't see you know wallpapers and toilets you know of course you'd find these uh, you know these idiocies even now even today but then you know it's for us to kind of learn from the mistakes of the past and then move on why do we have balconies you know why why do we have you know buildings have gardens why did cities start having public parks you know and why did landscape even have a place within you know landscape open spaces you know start even having a place within cities it was essentially all to do with you know our response to diseases then comes this very interesting thing about uh, you know quarantine uh, so how do you, do you know how did the word quarantine come into being um so basically when uh, there were these merchant ships which were coming to venice and uh, this was during the time of the plague and uh, what they had done was to prevent the plague from entering their city they uh, held off the merchant ships for 40 days and 40 is quarantine in the in their language and that's where quarantine comes from absolutely absolutely so i i think you explained it very well so essentially it was a way of spreading the black death from entering into europe because venice was a um, a very busy port for most of the east you know so all this everything would basically enter into europe via venice the arab merchants would basically get them and you know it would basically enter europe via there so quarantine essentially means um, you know 40 um, it basically is 40 days in latin you know that's how you know it kind of comes in so quarantine if you look at it you know as a practice is basically spatial as well as it's temporal you know 
and why do i say that because it's almost like an algorithm of you know adding space and time and preventing us from encountering something that's unpleasant you know are we actually adding space no we are basically creating space within the space that's already there are we actually adding time not really but then we are basically prolonging or delaying the fact that we may get the disease you know so it's it's basically you know we're kind of creating the situation so that we don't encounter it immediately and it's stayed same for centuries you know so imagine our technological uh, advancements from there to now but then it's it's still the same now this is a very interesting uh, image you know so this is basically the, the astronauts who've come back from uh, outer space in 1969 you know from the moon and so they were basically quarantined by nasa in a airstream trailer for i guess 21 days 3 weeks you know and that's because you know there, there there were these rumors of a lunar plague and you know of what if they would get back some other organisms with them and if you if you are a science fiction fan you would know that you know a lot of movies have also been made on the same thing you know of people going abroad and you know some and contacting a certain disease and then coming back and you know or or or, or their spaceship getting affected by it you know so and it's it's the same you know we we do the same now what 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 happens if i have to travel to let's say bangalore you know i'll be forced into a quarantine if i have to go for a conference in london i'll definitely be forced into a quarantine for 14 days so it's it's essentially the same different time different space scenario a quick wrap up of what we you know study today and also a certain bit of sensitivity for your understanding this may seem a bit advanced for you because ab tak jo humne baat kiya that was you know kind of very very you know understandable very very you know like it's it was tangible you know one could basically understand this but this is also important for you to know so when i talk of climate change and of the pandemics they are two different entities altogether okay because climate change is actually a long term threat you know and it's uh its manifestations are actually long in terms of time scale and the solutions that we need for um, you know climate change are essentially very systemic and when i say systemic what do i mean it basically means that you know they are interconnected and there are different different uh, systems which need to be in place for uh, tackling climate change while on the other hand pandemics and especially covid it's an immediate threat you know it just it just and the time scales are really short i mean it just started off you know like one fine morning and it's kind of taken over and we know for sure that if a technical solution is found it can just end very quickly as well and even in the past if you look at pandemics they've always had a a curve which kind of goes up an exponential curve that goes up and then there is a peak and then it kind of comes down of course i mean you know that could mean a lot of devastation it doesn't mean that the the world remains the same same even then many people would have lost their lives people would have lost their livelihoods you know the way cities are designed change you know the way people live change so it's not always a positive outcome actually it's not a positive outcome for both you know both climate change as well as for pandemics but most of the solutions for pandemics are technical solutions so there are lots of parallels that one could you know kind of um you know draw out of this you know between pandemics and climate change i mean the fact that the physical effects you know always translate into a variety of socio economic impacts you know is is a common between both of them you know global supply chains are affected they disrupt people's lives and livelihoods you know the effects are very systemic you know and and especially in an interconnected world today both pandemics and climate change actually has you know effects which are you know far reaching it, it doesn't just stop to one small spot in the world you know it basically affects the entire world then also there is something called a threshold it is something that you need to uh, understand i mean just very generally understand because you know you may come across this term in scientific discourses and all of that so imagine a rocking toy hmm? so you keep pushing the toy the rocking toy would go down it would come back you keep pushing it it would go down it would come back right but you know uh, imagine if one of us goes and you know hits it so badly that that rocking toy just falls down you know it just tumbles over will it then regain and come back it wouldn't right so basically we've breached its threshold 
you know it's like a punching bag you know you punch a bag it would hit back it would come back but itne zor se mara ki bag hi toot ke niche gira to fir you know it can't happen. so that's exactly what happens with the idea of resilience you know so there are these thresholds or there are these um, tipping points that we call which should not be breached so in the same manner if within pandemics and climate change you know if the tipping point is breached then it's very difficult for us to kind of control or bring it back so there is certain sense of non linearity or exponential curve don't worry about these terms you know it's something that you can eventually learn and you know read and then come across um and also you know sometimes both the pandemics as well as the climate change they act as risk multipliers you know let's say for example you know controlling the pandemic was as it is difficult and suddenly floods happen you know and people have to be hold into you know a, a municipal school on the high ground where you know everyone has to be put in one place because it's raining torrentially outside तो इतने दिन जो आपने कंट्रोल किया इतने दिन आपने सोशल डिस्टेंसिंग जो किया ऑल ऑफ इट गोज फॉर अ टॉस राइट सो इट मल्टीप्लाइज अ रिस्क एंड इट्स द सेम द अदर वे अराउंड एज वेल यू नो वी बीन टॉकिंग ऑफ रिड्यूसिंग प्लास्टिक्स वी बीन टॉकिंग ऑफ यू नो रीयूजिंग यू नो थिंग्स एंड रीसाइक्लिंग थिंग्स एंड ऑल ऑफ इट बट व्हाट हैपेंड विद द पेंडेमिक नाउ वी नीड पीपी शीट्स वी नीड प्लास्टिक मास्क्स वी नीड यू नो एंड व्हाट व्हाट हैपेंस टू ऑल दीस प्लास्टिक्स यू नो दे हैव टू बी बायो इंसिनरेटेड और दे हैव टू बी सैनिटाइज्ड एंड यू नो एंड and what are we doing with the cities you know china is basically sanitizing entire cities and what what exactly are we doing there we are basically pumping in chemicals out into the air into the water everywhere in the you know in the garb of killing the microbes which are harmful we are also killing in all the butterflies we're killing in all the bees we're killing in all the other beneficial microorganisms now how would our flowers get pollinated i don't know how would our you know fruiting trees even bear fruits in future we don't know but we have to do it because human lives are at stake so you know in a way both of these are affecting you know each other in a in a really bad manner so they are multiplying risks and the most important aspect when it comes to us humans is that you know the 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 effects of these are highly disproportionate and they affect the most vulnerable the most you know so whether it's a pandemic or whether it's climate change so what are the differences you know pandemics are direct immediate and obvious you know i, I spoke about this earlier while climate change is gradual it's cumulative and it's actually distributed in a way that we may not even know what is causing which effect you know the time scales are entirely different you know pandemic within a few days to a week you know the entire world went into a lockdown but climate change may take its own sweet time to kind of or uh, you know manifest but nevertheless it's a it's a great uh, great problem so like one has systemic solutions the other one requires technical solutions like for example even one vaccine you know a discovery of a vaccine could change the way the pandemic would then be viewed you know but climate change does not have one single solution you know and yeah but then they also are risk multipliers that's it now one very um, easy example is malaria you know so India is actually a country where malaria is an endemic disease. Endemic, we spoke about, right? A disease which is found in that region. So when it comes to species, it basically means endemic is a species that is only found in a certain region, and not found anywhere else. But endemic in this, in in uh, in in you know, in immunological terms, basically deal with a disease which is there in a certain location or a locality. So our hundreds of years of research have basically found that. you know even though it's endemic you know there is a season variation to it like for example in punjab uh you know every summer malarial infections would go high high up and then it would come down that's basically because of the high the heightened humidity summer and monsoons so right? it's basically because of the heightened humidity that basically comes up because it's punjab for one is actually a highly river irrigated space within a dry zone you know so if you look at punjab if it were if imagine if there were no human beings living there you know then i'm, I'm sorry about the sound i think someone is constructing something you know upstairs there they're doing some work up there so you have to bear with the sound in the background um, okay so uh punjab basically has this uh, it's it's a hot and dry you know area and then suddenly what did we do we, in the last 100 years or so we created a lot of irrigation channels we have a lot of irrigation projects that kind of uh, function through and 
uh, you know, so it's kind of changed the microclimate of that area. You know, so the areas of which were hot and dry have now become humid. So this is one aspect. But what is amazing is that you know that our recent discoveries have found that a phenomenon in the Pacific, in the Pacific Ocean, you know, called El Nino. Every time an El Nino event happens in the Pacific. Malaria epidemics in Punjab increased by five folds in the very next year. So, can you see how interconnected the whole world is? I mean, kaha Punjab, kaha Pacific, you know, but kaha El Nino, you know, but every time an El Nino effect happens, the very next year you have this happening for like you know almost five times. So, this is one thought with which I would like to end the lecture. You know, because this is something that I want you to understand that our understandings of the world are. Extremely limited, you know, and our assumptions and our uh, presumptions and our apprehensions are all probably, uh, you know, not exactly accurate, you know, and that's something that we need to work on, and that's something that we need to be very, very clear that if we have to live, function, and ensure that the future generations can also live a happy life, then we need to kind of, you know, think about all this and then work and adopt a scene accordingly. So I think that's very, very important. Okay, so uh, that was the end of the lecture for today. Uh, I can take questions, we can have a discussion, and then we'll see where we take this. So first of all, I want to hear from you guys. How did you, I mean, was this new knowledge for you? Did you find it interesting? You know, I want to hear from you first. You know, maybe you can, you can speak up or you can even chat in. You know, it's, it's perfectly fine. Whichever that you're comfortable with. Uh, it was really interesting to know how many things which we wouldn't have even thought of actually came as a result of such uh, pandemics that have taken place in the past. Like, oh, there's an echo. Yeah, dear. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, dear. Yeah. You know, like for me, it was even fascinating for me as well. You know, when I you know, started reading about this and, you know, doing a little bit of research, which is why I thought it's important that I should tell you guys as well. Because I wish I had known this when I was a student. You know, my whole approach towards the world would have been kind of different. Sandeep? Yes? Uh, what is El Nino? El Nino, okay. El Nino is a, a climatic phenomenon that basically uh, happens in the Pacific which are essentially triggered because of, um, you know, temperature differences in the Pacific Ocean, which creates different currents to move through. And that has an effect on the way the, the winds move as well. So, and that affects cloud formation, that affects how seasons kind of move across. So it's like, um, we have a similar El Nino-like phenomena that happens in the Indian Ocean as well. It's called the Indian Ocean Dipole. So El Nino, if you look at it etymologically, it basically means the little boy in Spanish. Nino is like a, a small child. So, uh, so these are nicknames which are given to these climatic phenomena. Like for example, I can I can tell you a simpler example than El Nino. El Nino is way more complex than Indian Ocean Dipole. So um, you know Indian Ocean, right? And Indian Ocean is one of the only oceans which are not connected to the polar caps. Um, you know, like we have the Antarctic Ocean uh, or the Southern Ocean, you know, uh, to the south. Otherwise, if you look at it, um, you know, look at Atlantic Ocean or Pacific Ocean, they're all connected to the polar caps. So what happens is when the polar ice caps melt, there's a lot of cold currents that basically kind of come in from the top to these oceans. While well, Indian Ocean is pretty insulated that way. So we have a higher temperature in the Western Indian Ocean. So when I say Western Ocean, what I can do is I can actually show you a slide that will actually help you understand this better.
Okay, I have a I have a recorded version of this, so maybe you can just hear that. Ah, it's so complicated. I should do share screen. Just a window. Let me ask you this question. What's common amongst these three seemingly unconnected catastrophes? The 2018 floods in Kerala, the 2019 bushfires of Australia, and the 2020 locust attack in the South Asian subcontinent. Any guess? Climate change. And that was triggered by the human activity in the recent past, which has led to an uh, increase in the temperature. To understand this phenomenon, it's important to understand the geography of the Indian Ocean. If you notice, Indian Ocean is probably the only ocean which is not connected to the poles directly. While Atlantic Ocean and Pacific Ocean are connected to the North Pole, and the Antarctic Ocean, of course, is connected to the Southern Pole. So Indian Ocean is actually governed by a phenomenon known as the Indian Ocean Dipole which basically means a difference of temperature in the Western Indian Ocean, as opposed to the temperature in the Eastern Indian Ocean. A positive dipole essentially means a stronger or a warmer temperature in the West as opposed to the East. Historically, this dipole has always stayed within a safe limit of plus or minus two degrees. However, in the recent past, with the melting of the polar ice caps, the temperature of the Pacific Ocean has tremendously gone down. And if you notice that there are these geographic connections between the Straits of Burma, Thailand, and Australia, wherein the Pacific Ocean water mixes freely with the Indian Ocean, which essentially means there are cooler Eastern Indian Ocean temperatures as opposed to the warmer West. And this has led to a strong positive Indian Ocean dipole in the recent past, which has triggered the heavy rainfalls in the Western India, in Eastern Africa, and also in the Arabian Peninsula, which has often led to the formation of ephemeral lakes, which has led to the proliferation of the locust species. Also, a positive Indian Ocean dipole means a drier Australian subcontinent and bushfires. Okay, so... Uh, you guys saw that, right? Hello, are you there? Uh, yeah, Sandeep, I guess we heard it, but... Yeah, we I didn't know. see anything. We could yeah. just hear it, we could not see it. Oh, that bad. But okay. we could see Mehta. <laughs> Achha, okay. Oh, that's that. Uh, but anyway, you heard it, right? So essentially, um, Elino is a similar phenomenon wherein the warm current from the west basically move across the equator to, you know, uh, so what happens is when, when these currents kind of move across, it also creates a pressure difference. And when the pressure difference is created, the air column above also changes. And some, sometimes our monsoons are also affected by this you know, uh, by even, even by the El Nino. So all of these are extremely well-connected, you know, phenomena. I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Okay, is there, uh, is there anything else that you guys want to ask or, you know, want to share? Parth has posted a, a YouTube link. What is the link about, Parth? Uh, it's the same thing that you explained. Ah, okay. okay. Thanks. Okay. 
okay so if uh, that's it then we can end the class uh, right away uh, but then what i would like you guys to do is to kind of uh, go back and think about whatever we discussed today in the class you know and whatever you knew that you kind of read about um and also i give you a, a very simple task i mean it's not a marked assignment or anything it's just something to kind of keep you engaged and you know kind of get you to think in in certain ways um there is a global ecological footprint calculator which is available online okay so i'll send you the link i would actually like a fun exercise i would want you to in your free time i would want you to kind of calculate what exactly is your ecological footprint and then in the next class we'll have a discussion on it. we'll see what what is your ecological footprint okay and i'll explain what is an ecological footprint or what are bio capacities uh, in the next class but then you know if you can just do the small exercise it'll be great